Well, good morning and welcome to Old Fort Niagara. I'm Robert Emerson. I'm the executive director of the Old Fort Niagara Association. And today we're going to talk about the War of 1812. Uh, a couple of programs that we did earlier, we really focused on, on Fort Niagara's role in that conflict. But today we're going to look at the bigger picture, uh, the war as a whole. So uh, if we, we can go to the slides. So the War of 1812, an overview. What are the causes of the War of 1812? It, it's sometimes called the Forgotten War. A lot of people don't know much about it. Well, uh, in the bigger picture, war in Europe uh, really set the stage for this conflict between the United States and Great Britain. The Napoleonic Wars were going on and uh, Britain uh, fighting France, uh, especially in the, in the peninsula, which was Portugal and Spain. One of the ways that um, Britain hoped to limit uh, French uh, conquests was through naval blockade. Of course, Britain had a very, very large and effective Navy, the Royal Navy. Uh, so they're going to blockade France and try to deny them supplies. So um, this, is, this sort of sets the scene for growing discord between the United States and Great Britain. Uh, another thing that uh, people need to remember about the War of 1812, it hadn't been that long uh, since the American Revolution was fought. And Britain, in some ways, had still not accepted American sovereignty. Um, sovereignty meaning that we are our own country. Uh, so oftentimes um, they acted in ways that uh, disrespected uh, the U.S. as a country. So this played out uh, in impressments. Uh, they would take uh, sailors off of merchant ships, um, impressing them into the, uh, into the British forces, uh, interfering with United States trade. Again, they're, they're trying to deny supplies to France. And uh, one other thing that uh, upset uh, the Americans at this point was British support for native uh, nations who were fighting against settlers on the frontier. The, uh, the US government felt that the British were supplying arms and ammunition uh, to these warriors who were attacking frontier settlements. And of course, the, sl the slogan, free trade and sailors' rights, that really um, sort of summed up a lot of the complaints that the United States had against Great Britain. So, uh, war is declared uh, in June of 1812. The United States declares war on Great Britain for all of these reasons. But the question is, was the United States ready to fight a war against one of the most powerful empires on the face of the planet? Um, well, and the answer is no, a resounding no. Um, at the beginning of the war, the US Army has only about 13,000 regular soldiers, and many of these men are untrained. Now, the state militias, in, in a lot of states, um, uh, there, well, actually it was a federal law that each state had a militia and generally it was from ages 18 to 45, you were signed up in your state militia. And this could muster some 700,000 men on paper, um, but rarely uh, did that work out uh, too well. Uh, state militias were oftentimes more social clubs than fighting forces. It's kind of like, you know, handing the Rotary Club muskets and telling them to go out and fight. Imagine, imagine that. A lot of the military leadership in the United States was aged or they were political appointees, um, not necessarily combat experienced veterans. And the army really didn't have a, a proper staff to take care of a lot of the administrative details and they didn't have a very good supply system. So all of those things made the United States 
was very unprepared to declare war on Great Britain. And not everybody agreed that war was a good idea. Um, particularly in New England states, there was a lot of opposition to the U.S. getting into the war. So um, how does the US, United States take the offensive against Britain? Well, invading Britain was out of the question. The aforementioned Royal Navy was a big problem there. So if the United States is going to take the offensive to attack something British, uh, they're gonna have to attack Canada because it's close, it's handy. And early on, uh, American leaders thought that it was gonna be easy, a mere matter of marching, uh, it was said. So there's a three-pronged, uh, in, in 1812, they have plans for a three-pronged campaign. And we can see on the map here, uh, the early United States, um, we're going to uh, attack at Detroit, at Niagara, and at Montreal. Well, none of those went well. Here locally, uh, the Battle of Queenston is fought in October. Of course, why does it take from June when war is declared till October? Well, because people are unprepared. So it takes time to mobilize forces and concentrate forces in the right places. And you also have to, when you have an army of thousands of men, you have to feed them. So just getting those supplies together is going to take a lot of time. So the U.S. Army concentrates uh, 6,000 men at Lewiston. And Lewiston is just a, a, little, a little hamlet at this point. Uh, a few families, so 6,000 men are descending on, on Lewiston. And that's, uh, that's, that's going to be an incredible impact on the area here. What their goal is, is they want to cross the river to Queenston and before the end of the, the season so that they can hold a, a, a foothold on uh, British soil. And the battle's a disaster for the Americans. Um, they don't have enough boats. The first waves get across, and they're initially fairly successful. But uh, then British reinforcements arrive. Uh, General Brock famously is, uh, is, is killed. Uh, but the British win, and the Americans cannot get back across the river uh, because they don't have enough boats. 500 killed and wounded, 960 prisoners of war. So the Americans lose more men as prisoners of war than uh, they do killed and wounded. But that's because they're trapped. They're trapped by the British who have won the battle. Well, um, American General Smith, he plans an attack on Fort Erie at the southern end of uh, the Niagara River uh, in November, but that attack is canceled. There we see some images of Fort Erie. We're gonna come back to Fort Erie a little bit later when we talk about the 1814 campaign. Fort Erie was originally uh, constructed during uh, Pontiac's Rebellion uh, in 1764. It wasn't the same fort, there was a in fact, the original Fort Erie, I believe, would now be under, under Lake Erie. And then the Fort Erie that we know of today um, was built later. Um, but we'll come back to Fort Erie and talk about that in the, in the 1814 campaign. So over the winter of 1812-1813, um, both sides used this period of time to increase their forces on, on both sides of the border. Um, armies in, in this time traditionally did not fight in the wintertime. Um, you could raid in the wintertime, but mounting a large campaign in the winter was very tough because if you're moving over land, um, your supplies has to have to move by horse and wagon. And you don't have forage or feed for your horses, 
you have no transport. Uh, same thing if you're moving by water. Um, lakes and rivers can freeze, and that can also impede your uh, shipment of supplies. So armies are using the winters to regroup and build up their forces for the next year's campaign. So 1813 comes along, and again, um, there's a couple of different plans that are hatched by the U.S. Um, uh, Secretary Armstrong wants to attack Kingston and cut the British supply line. Now, if you look at this map, Kingston is at the northeast corner of Lake Ontario, um, right there. The British supply line, of course, uh, extends all the way out to the west. You can see on the map all the way out to the Detroit area. Uh, Ad Admiral Chauncey, who's in command of the American fleet on Lake Ontario, and General Dearborn of the Army, they want to attack York, which is what Toronto was called in 1812. Unfortunately, the inferior plan wins. Um, essentially, instead of cutting off an arm at the shoulder, they're just going to cut off a finger at the tip. Um, cutting the supply line at Kingston would have, would have created much greater problems for, for the British. But they're going to attack York or Toronto, and then they're going to come back and attack Fort George. So let's go on. In April, the U.S. forces capture York and burn buildings there. And that's going to come back a little bit later in the war to a, uh, a more famous incident. Uh, so that, that attack is successful. After they secure York, they move on to the Niagara region. And in late May, U.S. forces captured Fort George. This was an amphibious operation, meaning that uh, troops landed from ships out in Lake Ontario. Uh, fort Niagara supported the landing with artillery, and the fort, Fort George, was secured, held for just about the rest of the year by U.S. troops. So having lost Fort George, the British now have to retreat to the west, and they're going to go to a place called Burlington Heights, which is the Hamilton, Ontario area. And this is, this is a very strategic area because there's high ground there, but there's also a strategically important road that connected uh, the Lake Ontario region with British settlements to the west, going out more toward Detroit. So Burlington Heights is a very strategic place. Well, um, things have gone pretty well at this point, at, but the American army moves west toward the British position. And at this time, they suffer two fairly devastating defeats at the hands of the British. On June the 6th, um, they are defeated at the Battle of Stony Creek, and they have to retreat uh, all the way back to Fort George. They don't want to be bombarded by the, the British fleet that's on Lake Ontario. So they have to come back to Fort George. And a second defeat later that month uh, at Beaver Dams, uh, again, turns the Americans back uh, to just holding pretty much Fort George. This is the famous Laura Secord episode where she is reputed to have gone and um, warned the British that the Americans are, are coming. So the British now come back and they blockade Fort George where the American garrison is holed up. Uh, unfortunately for the, the war in this area, uh, another offensive again against Montreal is going on and a lot of American forces that could have been used here at Niagara have been withdrawn to support this offensive against Montreal. And the reason Montreal was so important was there's a system of waterways 
in eastern New York. Uh, Lake George, Lake Champlain, the Richelieu River. Uh, they form a water highway between uh, the Hudson Valley and uh, the St. Lawrence. Uh, and Montreal is uh, just to the southwest of that. So uh, this is a natural invasion route that's been used all through the, co uh, the colonial period. It's been used during the American Revolution. And it's a water highway uh, straight into the heart of British Canada at this point. So troops have been removed to support that offensive against Montreal. And that puts the American forces here on the Niagara uh, in a weak position. But not all is, uh, not all is, uh, is going badly. In September of 1813, there's the Battle of Lake Erie that's fought on the western end of that body of water. Um, that's an American victory, and that hands control of Lake Erie over to the U.S. Navy. Uh, on uh, the next month, in October, Americans defeat the British at Moravian Town. And uh, Tecumseh, who had worked very hard for, to establish a native homeland, he's killed in that engagement. And that really ends the hope of a native homeland. So those, uh, those successes have an impact uh, on the, the war here in Niagara, but we'll, we're gonna come back to that in a moment. So we talked about Montreal and why the, the US troops were removed from Niagara for an, another offensive. So this attack on Montreal is the largest American operation of the war. And they're gonna move down the Richelieu River to, uh, to try to seize that city. There are two battles fought, Chrysler's Farm and Chateau Gay, and they are both American defeats. So that campaign uh, fails miserably. Uh, back here on the Niagara, Fort George has to be abandoned uh, because they just feel that they can't hold out this bridgehead on, on the, the Canadian side. So, so they decide to return to the east side of the Niagara River. And in doing so, they burn the town of Newark. We refer to Newark as Niagara on the lake today. Um, they did this with the idea of depriving the British uh, army shelter, but of course it displaced many, many civilians and it led to revenge on the part of the British, and which we'll, we'll get back to uh, again in a moment. So the British are resolved to take revenge and uh, they're going to plan uh, an attack on the Niagara frontier. They first captured Fort Niagara on December 19th. This is a pre-dawn surprise attack at five o'clock in the morning. It takes them about 30 minutes to uh, capture the fort. They do this at the point of a bayonet. They don't even load their muskets because they don't want to risk uh, an accidental discharge alerting the American garrison. And we talked about the, the capture of Fort Niagara in an earlier uh, episode, but so we're not going to go into that um, in detail today. This is more of an overview. But after the Fort Niagara Falls, uh, the British are going to burn Youngstown and Lewiston, uh, Manchester, Schlosser, that's where Niagara Falls is today. And they're going to go south to Buffalo and Black Rock by the end of December. So the, uh, the eastern bank of the Niagara River is a charred ruin by this point. So this creates a lot of refugees. Civilians have to flee to the east. And a newspaper report of this time said that all of the settlements in a section 40 miles square, that's a lot of area, and which contain more than 12,000 souls are effectually broken up. Our roads are filled with people, many of which have been reduced to the last degree of want and sorrow. Just imagine this, if you were a civilian sitting in your house and minding your own business and all of a sudden, bang, you're out of, you're out of a house you're a refugee, you're fleeing to the east, you're worried about your safety. And I'm sure that uh, that thought went equally through the residents of Newark who were forced to do the same thing. 
Well, that wraps up the campaign of 1813. Fort Niagara is now in British hands and will remain so for the rest of the war. Now, rather than um, taking back Fort Niagara, uh, the 1814 campaign is going to focus on uh, sending troops over to Canada from Buffalo. And uh, ultimately, they had hoped to seize Burlington Heights and cut that road that went west toward Detroit. Uh, that was the original plan. So um, 1814, there's a bit of a game change happens in 1814. Uh, and again, it goes back to the European uh, theater, if you can call it that. Uh, Napoleon, who was the emperor of France, um, he is defeated in 1813 and, and in Leipzig, Saxony, uh, now part of Germany. Um, and he is forced to abdicate in April of 1814. Abdicate means that he has to give up um, the leadership of the French government. So uh, he is gone and the war, it's not over yet, but for the time being it is. This releases British soldiers and naval forces to come to North America and fight here. Uh, this had always been kind of a sideshow for the British, but now they're going to be able to send 16,000 men over to North America, and, and that's going to, that could have devastating consequences for the United States. 1814, though, is also the time when the U.S. Army reinvents itself, um, and actually that's going to happen in Buffalo where uh, training camps are set up. And a lot of military historians consider this really the first uh, modern professional training that the US Army is going to receive under leadership of new officers, uh, uh, more aggressive men like uh, Jacob Brown and Winfield Scott. Um, the training improves the discipline of the Army. The Americans cross the Niagara in July, and they captured Fort Erie uh, after a very short time. And then they move north along the west shore of the Niagara. And at Chippewa on July the 5th, they are going to meet the British Army, or a British Army, under a general named Rial. And this is a picture of the American Army advancing at Chippewa. It's a very famous picture. And um, Rial is reputed to have said uh, to one of his other officers, those are regulars. Uh, whether he said by God or not is open to debate, but he is supposed to have said, those are regulars. Well, why? He, he thought at first sight they were militiamen who were notoriously undisciplined and, and did not stand up under fire very well, but they were not militiamen. They were, well, some were militiamen, but this image uh, shows uh, U.S. regulars. And the, the really important thing about the Battle of Chippewa is the American Army stood up to the British Army in the open field and they won the battle. Uh, so this was kind of a milestone. And it really showed how the training that they had undergone in Buffalo uh, paid off on the battlefield. So uh, the Americans advanced northward uh, toward Fort George, but they decide they can't, uh, they can't attack Fort George without heavier artillery. And this is where the Navy on Lake Ontario kind of lets things down because they, they, they need to bring heavier artillery by naval ships, but Admiral Chauncey's a, a sort of a cautious uh, a man and he is not going to come through uh, with those heavier guns. So the Americans withdraw on July 25th, there's a deadly draw at Lundy's Lane. About 2,800 Americans fight 3,500 3, British troops to a bloody standstill. This battle lasted long into the night. Uh, it was a very, very uh, bloody conflict. After the battle, uh, the Americans retreat back down to Fort Erie uh, on the southern end um, of the Niagara River. 
Well, the British follow ultimately. And in August, they are gonna try to take back Fort Erie and they launch a very, very costly attack. 905 British casualties. Um, they are, the siege is not successful. So the British decide to break it off in September but even though the U.S. still holds Fort Erie, um, going into winter, they decide they really don't want to have to supply a garrison in Fort Erie uh, on the west shore of the Niagara River when there's going to be ice in the river and it's going to be difficult to supply these troops. So the U.S. destroys Fort Erie and retreats back across the river to Buffalo uh, on November 5th. Well, that's what's going on on the Niagara. And, you know, a lot, this was really the cockpit of the War of 1812. There's a lot of action here concentrated. Um, but there are other fronts as well. As I said before, the British have sent over fresh troops and they're combat veterans. They've been fighting fr French forces in Spain um, for a long time. So they're, they're combat veterans. They're led by experienced officers. Uh, this could really be devastating for the US. They plan a, a simultaneous attack up the Chesapeake and down or, and also up the Champlain Valley for um, 1814. The US forces try to stop the British army uh, that's attacking Washington, D.C. Um, at Bladensburg, Maryland on the 24th of August, uh, the American army is defeated. It's a, it's a devastating defeat. And it opens the way for the British to burn Washington, D.C., burn the Capitol, burn the White House, uh, which they do uh, on August 24th. But they are unable to uh, capture Baltimore Harbor, so that uh, effort ultimately fails. There is another um, engagement in 1814 that we'll talk a little bit about, and that is the Battle of Plattsburgh. And this was the northern invasion that was timed to coincide with the invasion of the Chesapeake. The British are coming south from Canada. And this is going to be a joint naval, uh, Navy Army operation. Um, British have a fleet. The Americans have a fleet. Um, the naval action does not go well for the British. Um, they are unable to um, sink the American fleet. And so the, the Army attack fails and the Americans win the Battle of Plattsburgh. Now, um, we have on the Niagara, coming back here, this is the situation at the end of, toward the end of the war in 1814. Uh, the Americans have withdrawn back to the American side, and you can see there the, the shaded area where Fort Niagara is. The British are still holding this particular piece of ground. So we're kind of moving back and forth here. Um, going back to the Chesapeake though, uh, Fort McHenry does hold out on September 14th, 1814. And so the British cannot, um, they cannot take over Baltimore Harbor. Uh, this is a famous incident. Uh, of course, Francis Scott Key uh, during this uh, bombardment of Fort McHenry by the British fleet, he wrote a poem, uh, The Defense of Fort McHenry, uh, better known as the words to the Star Spangled Banner. Um, here's an image here of the uh, garrison flag that we know today as the Star Spangled Banner. It's a sister banner to the flag that's behind me. Uh, the flag that's behind me is older than the Star Spangled Banner, probably by uh, about four years. Uh, but they are similar. The Star Spangled Banner is a little bigger. 
Uh, but the big difference you'll notice, they're both 15 star, 15 stripe flags. They had decided to add a stripe and a star for new states until there got to be uh, too many new states. And then they went back to the 13 stripes. But the big difference you'll notice between the, our flag here at Fort Niagara and the Star Spangled Banner is that on our flag, the blue field rests on a white stripe. On the Star Spangled Banner, it rests on a red one. Uh, so, but for the purposes of today, Fort McHenry holds out. And so the British Chesapeake campaign, even though it's very devastating to that region, um, it fails. And we come to the Battle of Plattsburgh, which I mentioned before. Um, here's a, a picture of the, the, the interesting thing about the, the battle was that the American, the American fleet uh, under Thomas McDonough, uh, they didn't want to meet the British on the, on the open lake. So they, they retreated into Plattsburgh Bay and they anchored the ships there, forced the British to come in and, and attack them. And um, the winds really didn't favor the British and the American ships got the advantage. Um, and so the naval, British naval attack was defeated. The army attack uh, failed as well and the British decided to withdraw back up into Canada. Well, shortly uh, later in the year, diplomats in Ghent, Belgium, had been uh, negotiating a peace agreement. And on Christmas Eve of uh, 1814, they, they uh, signed a treaty that would end the War of 1812. But the fighting is still going to go on. For one thing, of course, communication is really slow. You know, there was no CNN or, uh, or Fox News in those days. Uh, so, so the message that the peace has been concluded has to come all the way across the Atlantic Ocean, and it does not get here. Um, another British offensive targeting New Orleans. And why New Orleans? Well, New Orleans will control the Mississippi and all of that land that the Mississippi drains. So it's an important British objective. But on January 8th, 1815, Andrew Jackson defeats uh, a British force inflicting some 2,000 casualties. Uh, it's really a devastating defeat for the British. And Andrew Jackson, uh, pr with his motley and ragtag assembly, he even had pirates in his, um, <laughs> in his army. Um, but he had, he had good artillery, he had good riflemen, um, and the British attack was, uh, was defeated, the commander killed. Um, so Battle of New Orleans, big U.S. victory. A lot of people will tell you that, oh, this battle was fought after the peace agreement, but the treaty had not yet been ratified uh, by the U.S. So um, you can say it happened after the end of the war, but really not. So uh, uh, the, the peace treaty that's worked out goes to status quo antebellum, the way things were before the war. And that, um, that means that Fort Niagara is gonna come back to US possession. But again, it takes a long, long time for that to happen. It's not until May of 1815 that US troops reoccupy Fort Niagara. This is the last time that our fort would be involved in uh, in combat activity. All right. So um, that's the end of our slides. I'd just like to mention a couple things before we take questions. Um, if you're interested in reading more about the War of 1812, particularly here in the Niagara region, in our own backyard, I'm going to recommend this book. It's called uh, Staff Ride Handbook for the Niagara Campaigns. Um, we sell it here at the fort. It's by Lieutenant Colonel Richard Barbudo. If you want a concise and accurate history of the war here, War of 1812 here on the Niagara frontier, it's a very, very quick read. And if you want to get more information on it, just send me an email. Um, my 
address is remerson at oldfortniagara.org, R-E-M-E-R-S-O-N at oldfortniagara.org. If you're interested in, I can give you more information on this book. The author, who is a Western New York uh, native um, and a, a very well-known military historian, uh, is coming out with another book uh, this fall on the War of 1812 in Western New York. So that should be really very interesting. So at this point, um, let's uh, let's see about questions. Actually, we want to make an announcement. It looks like it's uh, Lillian birthday in two days. She's chatting to people. Uh, Lisa, you had a question about the pirates for your second grade class. Do you want to ask that or explain something? You have to unmute yourself. Yep, I know. Um, so my class has studied the War of 1812 and I was asking my students that kind of went out to you. I did send it to them privately too, asking them if they remembered why he recruited the pirates to help him down in New Orleans. Lillian, do you remember now? Annabelle? Evelyn, I think, disappeared from our, our programming. Annabelle, do you remember? You have to unmute if you want to talk, girls. There you go. Yes. Do you remember why they recruited the pirates down in the, what we learned? Do you remember? Talking to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why did he recruit pirates to help him in that last battle? She's asking a question. Anybody? Does anybody know? Elaine? If you know the answer, unmute yourself. Muted. Okay, let's, uh, unless you want to answer. Because Lee. of the swamp area. It was because of all oh. the swamps and the channels down below there and to help um, sweep up bridge. They, they, they could navigate the area much more easily than we could. And uh, of course, Jackson. Girls, was I'm surprised you didn't answer that. Jackson needed all the manpower he could get. Um, so he, he really did have a motley assortment of, of regulars and militia and, and backwoodsmen and Jean Lafitte. <laughs> and and that's, that's an interesting thing that I, I thought I'd mention. You know, everybody knows about the Battle of New Orleans, but nobody knows about the Battle of Plattsburgh, New York. Well, why is that? Well, I guess Johnny Horton never wrote a song about the Battle of Plattsburgh. And more people know about Andrew Jackson uh, than know about Thomas McDonough. <laughs> so Johnny, uh, Johnny Horton never wrote a song about Thomas McDonough. Lou, uh, Lou and Logan have a question if you want to unmute yourself. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, was Fortnite involved in the in, in the Civil War. Was Fort Niagara involved in the Civil War. War? Civil War? Is that your question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, sure. Civil War. Well, Fort Niagara was involved in the Civil War, but it did not see any action in the Civil War. A couple of things happen here during the Civil War. That, that's a war that's fought from 1861 to 1865. Um, it's interesting that some guys in the Army who were very young men in the War of 1812 are very old men when the Civil War breaks out, and they still want to, uh, they still want to serve. Um, but Lincoln, President Lincoln is you know, looking for younger leadership. Uh, we can go into that another time, but a couple, of, a couple of things happen in the Civil War here. Fort Niagara is in a peaceful uh, area. There's not going to be uh, any Confederate activity here. And in uh, July of 1861, right after the war breaks out, 
uh, there's a unit uh, in New Mexico that um, is captured by Confederates. And at that time, one of the ways that you could deal with prisoners of war was to put them on parole. And that meant that they were not sent to a prison camp. They were, let, they were allowed to return to their homes or return to someplace else out of the theater of combat. But they had to promise not to fight, uh, in this case, for a year. So these troops, these Union troops, were put on parole. So where are we going to send these guys from New Mexico um, that they won't be involved in combat? Well, we'll send them to the Great Lakes. All right, fine. So one of the companies comes to Fort Niagara, and they arrive here, I believe, in November or December of 1861. So imagine that you're going from New Mexico in July, where it's very hot, to Fort Niagara in December, where it's very cold, uh, and they stay here for a year, and then they their parole runs out, so they're now allowed to go back and fight, and they go to Fredericksburg, Virginia, the Battle of Fredericksburg, where most of them are wiped out um, in an attack on Maury's Heights there. Uh, so second thing about Fort Niagara in the Civil War is the U.S. was worried that Great Britain would come into the war on the side of the Confederates, and there might be an invasion from Canada. And so the government uh, put up money to rebuild a lot of the forts along the border, and Fort Niagara is one of them. So when you visit Fort Niagara and you see all of those brick walls, that uh, the brick revetments that line the main walls of Fort Niagara, those were all built during the Civil War between 1863 and 1866. And by the time uh, the project is finished, the war is over, as so often happens um, in, uh, in government. All right. Um, why was the Battle of Chippewa so important? Well, it's important in U.S. Army history. It wasn't that it was such a great strategic victory, but the American army, the American regulars stood up toe to toe with the British in the open field, which had not happened uh, previously very much. So it's, it's really regarded as a turning point in, in army history. All right, so um, another question. What side did the Native Americans support in the War of 1812? Well, they, they supported both sides. It depended on what nation you're talking about, where you live, what your connections are. Uh, a lot of natives supported the British. Some natives supported the United States. And in, in some of the conflicts, natives were fighting against natives. But um, a lot of them pulled out after the Battle of Chippewa um, you know, because of the, the carnage and the deaths. They thought, you know, let the white man fight this, this war. Some really loyal natives stayed with the British, but um, a lot on both sides pulled out. So um, we're out of time. Thanks a lot for your attention today. Um, we're going to be talking more about the War of 1812 on Tuesday. Uh, when we look at the great heroine of Fort Niagara uh, of the 1812 war, and that's Betsy Doyle. You'll all want to be back here for that. Um, and then next Thursday, we wrap up with Fort Niagara in World War I, which is uh, uh, pretty new to most people. So we, we do have a, a guest star speaker. Yeah, can I, I have a student, Lillian Sawadis, who's been trying to approach a question. She's been oh, raising her hand. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you see her okay. in the screen or is she not in your screen? Yeah, we can see her now. Go ahead, Lillian. Sir? You have to unmute yourself again. I have one question and one statement thing. Is there, what other, what other wars are going around on the world, in the world? At this time? Yes. Well, the main, the main conflict was going on in Europe. And that would, 
that would involve all the major uh, countries of Europe. As it applied to America, of course, the conflict between England and France was the one that had the, the major impact on, on us in the War of 1812. But in Europe, uh, there was um, the wars that really lasted from the early 1790s all the way up to 1815 during this whole uh, era. At first, it was revolutionary France. Um, the French had deposed their king um, after the French Revolution. Um, the citizens took over the government, and French were off and on uh, at odds with the Austrian Empire. They were at odds with Prussia. Um, they were at odds at some points with Russia. So this was really a huge conflict that uh, engulfed most of Europe over a period of many, many years. And that's why uh, until 1814, the British had very limited resources to send here to North America. But after Napoleon, who led the French, after he uh, gave up uh, his uh, emperorship in in April of 1814, that, that allowed the British to release all these regular troops to come to North America and it had an impact on our conflict. But to answer your question, that's what was going on in the bigger picture. And you also have a statement, Lillian? I forgot. Oh. <laughs> all right. So thanks everybody for being here today. We look forward to seeing you next week on Tuesday at 10 o'clock. I'd also like to just wrap up by giving a shout out to our field music that provide the, um, the fife and drum accompaniment uh, before the program. Thanks a lot. So long. Thank you. Thank you.